Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. We appreciate you checking it out. Interesting topic for today. Um, it's going to be the first video in a video series, just of two videos, looking at shock in the medical arena. Not, I am shocked, but a patient is in shock. Uh, and this first video is going to be a framework for understanding undifferentiated shock based on the auction delivery and auction consumption equation. Um, we'll start by defining shock and then we'll dive into this framework. Now this will not be a comprehensive video on auction delivery and auction consumption. We actually have done that already on the channel. Um, we will link it in the video description. Uh, we did a auction content, auction delivery, concepts and equations, explain clearly video. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested. This will be more so these topics as specifically related to a framework for understanding undifferentiated shock. So with no further ado, um, quick 30 second break for introduction, then we'll dive in. Hello everyone and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to provide you with free, interesting, relevant, understandable medical education and news for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. We have weekly videos that we debut Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with bonus medical education videos posted throughout the week. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Doctor community and follow along by hitting the subscribe button located in the bottom right-hand corner. We also encourage all likes and comments, even if it is just to say hello. All our video descriptions contain links for additional related videos that might be interesting, so don't forget to check those out. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. With no further ado, stay well, keep learning, and let's get to the video. All right, thanks for sticking around. So this first video will be on the framework for understanding undifferentiated shock. The second video, which we'll link in the video description, is going to be using this framework to understand the four general shock states uh, being distributive, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and obstructive shock. Um, so again, linked in the video description if you're interested in that, but this one will provide the framework to understand that one. So to start with, we need to make sure we're using kind of the same lingo, right? The same definition. So we're going to define what is shock, all right? And shock in its simplest form is tissue hypoxia, right? It's essentially that the tissues do not have enough oxygen as compared to the amount of oxygen they're consuming. And this eventually will lead to organ injury and it's in its worst sense, multi-organ failure, right? Because as those tissues don't get enough oxygen, those cells start to die. And as the cells start to die, the tissues start to die. And that's when we start to see kidney injury, liver injury. Um, you know, you can get demand ischemia in the heart and eventually multi-organ failure, which can lead to death. Um, so, you know, shock, a lot of times you're hypotensive or your blood pressure is low. A lot of times you have a high lactic acid, um, but in its simplest form, it's tissue hypoxia. Well, how do we understand tissue hypoxia? This is a great concept, but how do we actually understand what that means? And that's where we come into the bulk of this lecture, the framework, right? Tissue hypoxia means those tissues aren't getting enough oxygen delivered as compared to the amount of oxygen they're consuming. And that might be because the heart isn't able to deliver enough oxygen, cardiogenic shock, or it might be because those tissues are consuming so much oxygen because they're in overdrive, like septic shock, you have an infection. But even this introductory start, it doesn't really give us graspable bits, right? This makes sense, it's true, but it's not really clinically actionable, right? What is auction delivery? How do you make it better? You know, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna break auction delivery down into smaller and smaller bits until we get to a point where we actually have clinically applicable parts of this equation that we can manipulate and think about with an actual patient. Auction consumption can be measured, it can be manipulated a little bit, but for the sake of this video, auction consumption is going to stay stagnant. So shock is tissue hypoxia. Shock is we're not able to deliver enough oxygen as compared to the amount of oxygen the tissue is consuming. But what is oxygen delivery? How do we break it down? Well, oxygen delivery, if you really think about it, is just cardiac output, the amount of blood being pumped out of the heart. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of pluses in here, but this isn't really a true plus in the mathematical sense. It's, you know, proportional to combined with all that kind of stuff. So don't worry about this being a true plus. But cardiac output, the amount of blood being pumped out of the heart, 
and the amount of oxygen in that blood or the arterial oxygen content. This makes sense, right? How much oxygen is going through tissue is dependent on how much blood is flowing to that tissue and then how much oxygen is in the blood flowing to that tissue. These though still are not really clinically actionable, right? How can we measure or manipulate these two things? Well, you can break them down further. So cardiac output is broken down into heart rate and stroke volume. So heart rate being the amount of times the heart is squeezing, right? How, much, how many times the heart is pumping blood out of it towards the tissues. And stroke volume is the amount of volume of blood that the heart is pumping with each squeeze, right? How much blood is coming out of the heart each time it pumps. And that represents the cardiac output. It makes sense, right? If the heart rate is 60 beats per minute and the stroke volume is, I'm just going to make up a number for simplicity of use here, 50 cc's of blood. So every time the heart squeezes, 50 cc's of blood gets pumped out. The cardiac output is going to be, uh, am I doing my math right? Three liters, I guess. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, or 3,000 milliliters. Uh, a cardiac output, right, per minute. If it's pumping 60 times per minute and it's pumping out 50 cc's of blood every uh, every squeeze, it's going to be 60 times 50, right? And again, ignore these pluses. This would actually be multiplication. So now we've broken down cardiac output, but what about the arterial oxygen content? Well, what drives how much oxygen is in the arteries? And we actually know what drives that, right? So we know that hemoglobin, hemoglobin, which is the molecule in a red blood cell, right, you get all this hemoglobin, carries oxygen on it, right? So within a red blood cell, the hemoglobin carries oxygen on it. So the amount of oxygen in the arteries is going to be proportional to the hemoglobin, right? The more hemoglobin we have, the more oxygen it's carrying. The amount of oxygen that hemoglobin is carrying is proportional to the amount of oxygen saturated in the blood or the SAO2, the arterial oxygen saturation, right? And you actually can kind of measure that on the pulse oximeter on the monitor. So let's just say your oxygen saturation is 100%, right? That is going to be a higher amount of oxygen hemoglobins than if your oxygen saturation was 60%, right? Because there's less oxygen available to be loaded onto the hemoglobin. And then the other part of this, which is a much smaller part, is the PaO2. This is just the dissolved oxygen, right? So in the blood, we have a blood vessel. And in the blood, we have red blood cells. These are actual cells. And in the red blood cells, you have hemoglobin molecules. And on the hemoglobin molecules, it's carrying oxygen, right? As we talked about. But oxygen also can just dissolve into the blood and not be carried on the hemoglobin molecule. And that is the PO2, or the um, partial pressure of dissolved oxygen in the artery. And that is what makes up the arterial oxygen content, right? It's the amount of hemoglobin, and it's the oxygen saturation on that hemoglobin, and then it's the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood, right? So dissolved oxygen, hemoglobin, and oxygen saturation. And that's what's going to make up the oxygen delivery, right? It's going to be the cardiac output as determined by the heart rate and the stroke volume and the hemoglobin, oxygen saturation, and partial pressure dissolved oxygen. Now, we're almost to actionable bits, right? We're getting closer. Um, you know, if you wanted to increase oxygen delivery, you'd have to increase the stroke volume. How would you do that, though? You can break this equation down just a little bit further, right? So heart rate stays the same. We can measure heart rate on the monitor. We can manipulate heart rate with medications. Stroke volume, though, can be um, broken down into even smaller bits, right? And that is the preload, the contractility, and the afterload. Uh, that is what stroke volume is proportional to. What does this mean exactly? Well, to do that, we're going to draw a heart. Let's see if I can draw a heart. There's the atria. There's the ventricles. Um, so we have the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium. All right, we know that veins dump venous blood onto the right side of the heart. So this is vein, vein, and then we know that the left side of the heart pumps blood out to the lungs and the rest of the body through arteries. Um, so the amount of blood the heart is squeezing out each minute is going to be proportional to the preload, which is the amount of blood flowing into the heart, 
from the veins, the contractility or how hard the heart is squeezing with each pump, and then the afterload or the pressure that the heart is pumping against. Right? So does that make sense? The stroke volume, how much blood is coming out of the heart with each squeeze, is going to be proportional to the amount of blood loading into the heart, right? Because if the preload is too high, you're going to stretch that ventricle, and then it's not going to be able to squeeze as hard because it's so stretched. If the preload is too low, you're not going to really be able to fill that ventricle. So even if it squeezes hard, there's just not that much blood in it to start with. So you want kind of that perfect amount of preload where the ventricle is stretched just enough that it's full and it's loaded and ready to squeeze. Then the contractility, right? If the ventricle's full of blood and it only squeezes a little bit, the stroke volume, how much blood it's pumping out, is going to be less than if it's squeezing, if it's contracting more robustly, right? So contractility. And then the heart, the ventricle is pumping against an afterload, right? So if it's pumping against a bunch of afterload, it's not gonna be able, even if it squeezes hard, it's not gonna be able to pump as much blood out uh, with each squeeze because that afterload is high, right? So that is what stroke volume is proportional to. And these are measurable and actionable things, right? We can think about and measure how much blood is flowing into the heart, the preload. There's, it's, you know, a uh, much more detailed lecture uh, on the uh, intricacies of things like central venous pressure and IVC assessment and all that kind of stuff outside the realm of this lecture. But there are surrogates that we can look at that help us understand if the preload is adequate. Uh, same with contractility and same with afterload. So these are measurable and manipulable things. And then the arterial oxygen content, same equation, but there are just some... Uh, um, uh, constants here, so you can understand what's most important. You can see that the hemoglobin you multiply by 1.34 because the amount of hemoglobin is much more important to the arterial oxygen content than the amount of dissolved oxygen, which you multiply by 0 0.003. Again, check out that other video linked in the video description for more detailed dive into this equation. Um, but this is the framework we're going to use to understand the four shock states because the four shock states. Um, the, the problem going on that's leading to shock is going to be related to a part of this equation. And then what we can intervene on to try to fix the shock state is also going to be related to this equation. So now we have the framework. This video is done, but definitely transition into the next video, which is linked in the video description. Of course, let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Hit the like, subscribe, bell button, all that kind of stuff. Check out other videos. We appreciate y'all. Stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.